Women in the work. Women in the work. History was made last Tuesday when Mrs. Hillary Clinton became the first woman in American history to become a major political party presidential nominee to become president of the United States of America. This is uh, quite a milestone, yes. as she had mentioned in the year uh, 2008, that it was a glass ceiling. And that glass ceiling had 18 million cracks in it. <laughs> and this time I think it's coming down. Right. <laughs> uh, for ages, women have struggled to be treated fairly. Yes. Just as human beings. Yes. Uh, they have as many rights as men. But somehow throughout the ages, and depending upon the society and the customs, those rights has been, in some cases, uh, severely hindered. And some, in, in other cases, they don't have any rights at all. Yes, yes. Many in our country uh, believe that, especially in the work. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 14. And this is where it all kind of began. It all kind of began with these scriptures that people use now to justify the oppression of women. Which is, I'm here to tell you, for the Lord himself, that is wrong as two left shoes. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14, we're going to start in... Verse 34 to 35. He said, Women should be silent during the church meetings. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submiss submissive, just as the law says. If they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. This is what they said. They also mean that women were not allowed to teach or to ask any questions in church. Although in this same book, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5, Paul also indicates how women are prophesizing. But what, and that means preaching the word. Prophesy. And they say it is better to prophesy than it is to do anything else because you are giving instruction, edification. So you would say there is a contradiction there or maybe there is a misunderstanding there. Amen. Now see, when this was said, this was like all what some men wanted to hear. Mm. Of course, in Corinth at that particular time, you had some women that did get out of hand. I mean, they got rambunctious, rambunctious. Uh, they was dis disruptive. Uh, they was trying to basically take over the service. They had interpreted the scriptures just like anybody else would that wants power that they do not deserve in their own manner. Until they was ready almost to destroy the church. Mm -hmm. So you can have folks in the church can be that disruptive, that 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 wrong, or going behind people's back and 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 saying different things and being disruptive that can destroy the church. So Paul's job was to bring it all back together. So you can say. God made man first, and then he made the woman. This is another argument. Hey, we here first. Mm -hmm. Then came you. But how does, how does that work spiritually? She was made to be a mate for man. She was made to be a match for him. He, she was made to be comparable to him. Not inferior to him, but comparable to him. Amen. On the same level, so to speak, as him, spiritually. 
She was not to be some mindless robot or some dumb animal that had to be led to do everything. That was not the case. They were equal in God's sight with different functions. With different functions. Men have a function, women have a function. But that's not to say that there is a bit of crossover in our lives because everything doesn't work perfectly, especially in this sinful world. Even the Godhead is equal, but they have different functions. You got God the Father who is the head. You got Jesus who is the Christ, the anointed one, the Savior of creation. And then you got the Holy Spirit, which is the teacher, the counselor, the comforter. And also, our guarantee in our spiritual contract with God. But they are all God. Each and every one. And they are equal in that plane. Just like it is, it should have been for man and woman. To work perfectly in harmony together. And again, it should be the same way it is for us as men and women. To understand your function. Men cannot carry babies. That's obvious. That's obvious. Nor can women impregnate themselves. That's obvious. But we are to work together to increase mankind or to increase potential God being. But human nature, along with Satan, has twisted up. In most cases, I, I, I wasn't going to say in a lot of cases, but in most cases, our function and our understanding of what should be done or whose place it is to do this or whose place it is to do that. As it was with the Corinthian husbands and wives. See, the wives got a hold that since Adam knew what he was doing in sin, all the blame should be on him. Thereby, all the blame should be on men. <laughs> and so when they got a hold of that, they went buck wild. <laughs> and they started condemning their men, because, uh, condemning those that was, that was teaching them and, and preaching to them. They started having their own opinions. And they did not wait to get clarification or get a clear understanding of really what the scriptures was, was saying, they took it upon themselves. They interpreted it the way they wanted to interpret it because it seemed good to them. It was at their advantage. It wasn't about right or wrong. It was about advantage. That's how a lot of times as human beings we perceive things, not Truly, as God say what is right is wrong, but as we perceive them as they're going to benefit us. It has nothing to do with right and wrong. Only the right and wrong is in your mind. But the right and wrong is in your mind, I can guarantee you, is totally different from the right and wrong in God's mind. Yes. So, <clears throat> the Bible says they were not, we're not, he's not the author of confusion in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, you can write that down. He is not the author of confusion. Everything must be done decently and in order. He said, even if you speak, even if you prophesy, and some other individual got something to say, they say, you cannot be rude. Let that person speak, and then wait your turn. It's all about looking after the other man. But those were just some isolated incidents in the past. And it did happen that they had this kind of trouble where they had to tell the women where you cannot speak in this particular Corinth congregation. It was not in all of them. And they had to lay down the law and, it was, and everything is in the Bible is for our admonition as the Bible states. To let everyone know that Neither male or female can do as these individuals had done to cause such trouble and to start finger pointing and blaming one 
for all the troubles and uh, then elevating themselves and thus not creating harmony or cohesiveness, but in order to seek their own agenda or what they perceive it to be and want it to be. And so they proceeded to carry out those actions. And so Paul had to come down and say, hey, you're not permitted in this congregation to speak. You're going to have to wait until you come to an understanding and get yourselves together. Because if you want to ask the question now, because of these outbursts of wrath of yours, you need to go home and discuss that with your husband. <clears throat> and that's not to say that the husband knew all the answers, because he didn't. But in order to keep down the commotion that was going on, he said, then, you know, you take that stuff home. Take it home. And eventually they did get themselves together. But as you can see, they had two different things going on in Corinth. Some of the most powerful women in the Bible had churches in Corinth, <laughs> believe it or not. See, this is where this has all been taken out of context and misconstrued. You only, a lot of times you go in and you read what you want to read. Or you have even searched the scriptures until you can find something that can fit your mindset. Preach. That's what we do. And so during that particular time when the word was first coming out, it was first being revealed to everybody, it was easily to be misinterpreted and misconstrued, in which it was. <clears throat> and the Corinthian argument, is the explanation why a lot of church organizations to this day say women are not allowed to speak. Women are not allowed to preach. Women are not allowed to pastor. Some of them say, well, you can be a minister. You can teach Sunday school, but when it comes to preaching or teaching a man, you're not allowed to do so. And this is the argument in which they use in order to make that happen. And they search the scriptures like this to try to back up this misinterpretation of what God was saying or what the situation was during that particular time. That's why the Bible says you need to study to show yourself approved. Preach. So apparently they didn't study enough to show themselves approved because they got disapproved because they were not doing what God had approved. Okay. And so they wanted to Put the women down, so to speak, you know, the old saying, to keep them barefoot and pregnant. Mm -hmm. But that was not the case, not spiritually speaking. They also had it in their minds because they didn't want any more competition than what they had, that women could not pastor a church. That they didn't have enough understanding or sense to pastor a church. Yet they can run a complete household. <laughs> what sense do that make? Preach. And many, many, many women today, even today, is a single parent in running their household. And some of them can run it very well. Amen. And, and, and to be it, some of them don't run it very well. Like men. It, what difference does it make? What difference does it make? So God say it does not make any difference when it comes to my word. It does not make any difference whom I call to preach my word, okay. whom I call to pastor my church and my to shepherd my people. Amen. So you think, well, why did this come about? Well, man did it, mankind. Yes. And men wanted to keep their advantage over women. In some cultures, especially in the ancient times, women were not allowed to, to speak. You know, they was used more like as, as objects or, or a material possession. It has gotten better today, but you still got a lot of that going on. Around the world and other and other cultures, it is still like it was over two thousand years ago. Teach, and we're just now breaking out of it here in the United States of America, Amen. where they had to fight for the right to vote. Mm -hmm. They had to fight for the right to hold a political office, Amen. 
And most, and most do a very good job yes. at their yes. position. Yes. And that's let the truth be known. Amen. If I can tell you through my own personal experience, some of the best uh, supervisors I had were women. Amen. Okay. Not the knucklehead Smith. <laughs> so you can see how individual organizations continue to oppress their own congregations by not letting everyone have their opportunity. And as a matter of fact, they're standing there in opposition of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not like the Holy Spirit is not where they're at. The Holy Spirit is working with the ladies in their congregation. But they are resisting the Holy Spirit. And don't think if that's something strange, because we too can resist the Holy Spirit for our own gains, for our own means, for our own self-interest. We'll go against the Word of God because it is not fitting our mindset. It is not fitting how we see it supposed to be. And so thereby we dishonor God and we dishonor His Word when we do things like that, when we think things like that, when we say things like that. And God is looking for perfect harmony. Now I can say here in the, in the, in the truth and the light, guess what? The ministers in this church are women whom God inspired me to anoint because they were qualified. Amen. It wasn't about their gender either. Right. They just happened to be women. But this is what God chose. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to go against what God chooses. When you go against what God chooses, you are running on bad ground. You teach. And I'm here to tell you, I don't care if you're baptized and, and, and think you're full of the Holy Spirit, but when you are resisting God, when you are resisting his authority, or you are, say, resisting these women who are ministers or any minister, I don't want to be in your shoes. I really don't. Because you are resisting Jesus, and you're going to have to eventually stand and, and give an account. Why did you do that? Why did you cause such trouble? Why, why was you doing this to whom I have chosen? What gave you the right to over, override me? And then you have to sit there and explain that. But of course, right now, you, you could explain it away in your own mind because it's still your own agenda. Pretty and you have not been called to count yet. But you will. But you will. And it's, what it is, you have time to repent. Because what it is about God, it's about obedience. The same thing we talk about our tithes and offerings. Our tithes, our tithes is a is a sign of our obedience to God. Oh, yes. And that's what he wants more than anything. Amen. More than anything. You, your sacrifice, your anything that you could give to God or give to anybody else. Mm -hmm. But the main thing he's looking for is your obedience. Amen. That's what made Abraham the father of the faithful. Mm -hmm. That he was obedient and did not hesitate. To take his take the life of his son, his only son, his only son after he had after he was a hundred years old. You know how precious Isaac was. Mm -hmm. And this is what made these two individuals unique. Because Isaac was not a, a young boy that didn't know any better. He was a man. Mm -hmm. And he allowed himself without resisting, like Jesus did, because they were a type of the father and the son. Come on, man. yes, yes. And so when the father told Abraham, get up! But I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son, to a to a place where I will show you. And believe it or not, taking him to the area to where Jesus would be killed himself. Amen. And they got up, they gathered up they would. They're taking some servants with them to help them carry this because it was about 50 miles away from where they were. And they got up early in the morning and got to it and got to walking. And then when it came near the spot,
spot. You told the servant, you stay there. And, you, and this is this is why you know, because Isaac was a man, because he was able to carry all of the firewood for the sacrifice. If he was a boy, he couldn't he couldn't have lifted that. And so he took it, and they spread it. As he was going along, he said, "Well, uh, uh, Father, where is the lamb that we're going to sacrifice?" Preach. And Abraham turned around and he said, "The Lord will provide." <laughs> And they kept walking. And then they got to the place. And then they spread it out. The wood for the sacrifice. And then Isaac allowed his father to bind him. Hands and feet. And lay him upon the altar. And then Abraham without hesitation pulled the knife out that they used for the sacrifice. And was coming down. And God stopped God stopped him. And he said, now I know. Now I know that you will obey me. Amen. Because you were going to sacrifice your son. Your only son. Just like I'm going to do later on. Sacrifice my only Amen. son. Amen. Preach. And so he blessed him. When you could read in that the excitement and the joy that God had because Abraham was going to do that. Because Abraham believed. He said, hey, this is God. I believe God. Yes. Because God said, everything is going to come through Isaac. Mm -hmm. So if I take this knife and kill him, he's going to raise him up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he's going to keep his word. Amen. Amen. And God knew that. God knew that. Now, I would never want to be placed in that position. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'm telling you right now. But Abraham, let me tell you something. When God gets ready to put you somewhere in a tight spot, he has prepared you ahead of time. Yes, yes. Yes, he has. He has prepared you ahead of time. I guess just like for this, he had prepared me ahead of time because I had 11 aunts. And they were the most prominent adults in my, in my life, in my family. Preach. And so I was comfortable with women. I was I, I saw how they operate. I saw what they could do. I, I saw the wisdom of them. I also saw the foolishness of them. I've seen it all. And so I was comfortable with that. Some folks are raised that a woman needs to sit down and shut up. Yes. That's right. <laughs> but some folks has been raised by nothing but a woman no better than that. Okay. Amen. And so what it is, is about fairness. It's about equity. And mankind, our human nature, always want to take advantage of someone. Preach. This is where the Holy Spirit takes place. This is the, the reason for the Holy Spirit. Is that it is to wipe away all that miseducation and misinformation that you've gotten over the years. All that Wrong stuff, how you've been raised over the years. That stuff when you put it up against the word of God, it does not hold water. So the Holy Spirit is in you to get you to be able to discern what that is. Preach. And not to uh, hold somebody account or to have ill feelings about them because they've done the best they could. But to just to let you know. That what they did is not right, and that is not the path for you to follow. Because he wants us to be in all righteousness. And women being in authority is part of that righteousness. Preach. And we have to understand that. You have to break away from those old traditions that all of us grew up with, and, and especially those that's got some age on them a little bit. And that's the way it was. That we were to go out and provide for the family. And like June Cleaver, the wife's supposed to be at home in a dress and an apron and pearls and high heel shoes and, and have the dinner ready. And then the husband come home from work, wash his hands and get dressed for dinner <laughs> along with his kids. <laughs> that's the way we're supposed to live. <laughs> I never seen it in my neighborhood that way. <laughs> but that is the concept. That is the concept. 
But in reality, men and women both had to go out and to provide for the family. So they had to work together. It was not all the time that the lady had to prepare the meal and all that and get the kids ready. The man had to step up and get in there too. Preach. So women do not need to be kept in what they call their traditional place. And some guys is only too happy to keep them there. They're only too happy to read 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35. Yes. And they love that scripture. They'll die by that scripture. Because they feel if anybody got a chance to get promoted, see, they don't, they don't even understand the calling. That they don't have to worry about being in competition with some woman. That's ignorance. That's ignorance. Man did, God did give man the responsibility to take care of his, his family. We're, we're built for that. Most of us, we are, we are, we are not only we're guilty, it's like an instinct in us. We're, we're bigger. We're stronger. But that's not to say that in some cases you got some women just as strong as men or even stronger. And I've seen them. <laughs> you don't want to mess with them. <laughs> I noticed this lady named Mrs. Thompson and everybody called up Mrs. Thompson. <laughs> you didn't want to mess with Mrs. Thompson. And some women went out there and worked hard. And right alongside me and doing the same thing. But they cheated them. Yes. They didn't want to pay them the same thing that right. the men still got. Still, still doing it. And especially during <laughs> the time of World War II, mm -hmm. when a lot of the men were in services and they needed workers. So they had to employ the women to do that kind of work because there just wasn't no men around. Preach. And they did, did the work as they give you the picture of Rosie the River. Yes. Yes. Amen. Uh, my mother was one that was a Rosie the River. That's right. She built airplanes. She had a river gun in her hand. And I retired with one in mine. <laughs> and that's the way it was. They worked 12 hours a day. Six, seven days a week. Alongside men in order to take care of their families. Amen. So it's not that they cannot do the job, they can do the job. But it's about the calling. Every woman is not called to pastor a church. Every man is not called to pastor a church. Preach. you got to understand what God is doing. Let the Holy Spirit do His work. It, I think it knows better than us. Teach. And so when they call an individual to do the work, then that's the work in which they do. And everyone around them should support them when they do it. Mm -hmm. And that, that brings great pleasure to God. But when you don't, that does not bring pleasure to God. And if you continue on a path like that, I don't care who you are, sooner or later, the Lord is going to tap you on your shoulder. And his tap could be very hard. Preach. To get you, not to hurt you, but to just to get you to come to an understanding. Mm -hmm. Say, this is my choice. This is whom I have picked. Because a lot of women, once they, once they pick, you know, they run into a lot of opposition. Mm -hmm. Amen. People looking for some excuse. Mm -hmm. Some excuse to defame them or to put them down or to say they're not qualified. Is if they don't breathe air like everybody else. So hopefully this ignorance is on its way out. Hopefully it's, this ignorance is on its way out. That's the, as I said before, it's not to say that, that uh, every woman has been called to pastor or, or to preach the word. Because that's not true. Some ladies are very happy to be at home and taking care of their home Preach. And, their, and, and their family. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah mm -hmm. for those that that are fulfilling that job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah uh, to the man that honors that lady that is taking care of his home Amen. and his children and his, and, 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 and his family. And he recognizes that fact. Yes. And he appreciates that fact. He don't think of her lesser. Mm -hmm. He figures that this is my mate. Okay. This is this is we're making it. This is this is this is how we roll. Preach. And it's only natural. I mean, we have a it is natural. Mm -hmm. It is not natural for anybody to deliver the word. It, it is not. Man, woman, or beast. Because the beast did deliver the word once, a donkey. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't tell me who God can't call. Teach. <laughs> Teach. If he can call a donkey, I know he can call anybody. Teach. Amen. But let me tell you about, and, and this is this is what I want my brothers and sisters to understand that don't that do not understand this concept. And God put it so eloquently in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 23. 1 Samuel 15 and verse 23. Because no man need to be up there, and we got some men, and maybe some men right now, that think they are king. They think that everybody else are their subjects and should bow down to them. But the flip side of all of this, of all of any of it, in 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, it is rebellion. This is what God says about it. This is what rebellion is yeah. to him. When you go against God's anointed, this is what you're up to. This is what you're doing. And Christians do this. Mm -hmm. Christians do this. Now, you can expect it from a person that's, that's not a Christian, that's not called, but Christians do this. Because the Bible is mainly written for you. Amen. You that supposed to believe, these are reminders of what you're supposed to believe. He said rebellion is a is sinful as witchcraft. And stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. Teach. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord. And that's what it is. You reject the command of the Lord when you reject whom he has called. Preach. And there's a, a lesson here to take heed. That commotion and disruption and spreading of malicious talk in a congregation of God is not acceptable at all. It does not matter whether you are male or female. If we're not spreading love and unity, then what is the point? Amen. What is the point? That's why we're all here. Because we're missing that element in our lives. We was missing that, that true love in our lives. So if we think it's okay to point fingers at people and always having a negative remark to say about one thing or another, then we are just judging. We are just, and, and no one has been called to that. Because it's always according to our own particular standards and beliefs. It has nothing to do with God. Nothing. Everything to do with your human nature. Because that is not God. It just isn't. It's not God. Just like when Aaron and Miriam was complaining against Moses. And they was using this Ethiopian woman that he had married because Sephora, his wife, had long been dead. And so... He had married an Ethiopian woman. So they was whispering and plotting re rebellion and talking about Moses and saying he ain't this and he ain't that. I don't like this about him. I don't like what he did here. I don't like that. And what did God, that's a lesson for us. Peach, and what did God do to them? He said, hey, you two, over there behind the tent. Come over, come out of here. <laughs> And he knew it wasn't about the Ethiopian woman. It was about, because if you read it, they, they were saying, well, we got the Holy Spirit too. I got the Holy Spirit too, so having God spoken to us? So what made him so big and bad? Why do, why do we have to listen to him? 
because they was getting jealous and puffed up and they wanted things to go their own way. And God got them out there and stricken Miriam with lepers. <laughs> she was white as Santa Claus. And that struck fear in the Aaron's body. I mean, he was trembling like nobody's business. So God already knew he probably had to go clean himself. You know, after. Because you imagine God done called you out. You and your stuff. You know, you've been whispering to somebody else and God is standing there listening to you. And you want to deny it. You want to lie. Yeah, you do. I didn't say that. Yes, you did. And we all been guilty one one time or another of doing something like that. But unfortunately for us, we have most of the time you have not been called. But just to let you know that God sees and hears everything. Everything. And give you another indication that how when he chooses his leaders, that's who they are. And they say they, they need to be treated with with much respect mm -hmm. for the work in which they do because they are accountable to me for your soul. Amen. And if they don't do as I instructed them to do, I'm bringing scudgeon down on them. Amen. That's something that you ain't got to face. Mm -hmm. So don't give them trouble. You help them in every way you can. Preach. And that's the same thing. See, a lot of folks, when women are elevated, like Joyce Myers, the love of the day. Yeah, I love, love her. She's speaking the truth. Yes, yes. Amen. She talks about life the way it is. Right. And what you need to do to improve your life. Amen. And improve your life with others. Yes. But she got many haters. Yes. That's in the pulpit. Yes. And all of all of her haters are in the pulpit. Yes. Supposed to be men of God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I scratch my head and wonder, where are you? But like anything in all of us, we have the right to choose. We, we can choose to, to allow the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, or we can choose not to. We can resist the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We as Christians yes. do that. Because something might strike your nerve. But the whole part of developing Christian character is your nerves to be struck. Preach. Yes. Because what good is a nerve that cannot take a little tingle every now and then? Yes. Because it's, it's all about us changing ourselves. And when you change, change is hard. Mm -hmm. We don't like to change. Just admit that. You say, oh, well, I have changed. Have you? You are changing, hopefully. Changing in this area and standing still in the other. And this is the way it is. This is the way we, why we come together as a congregation to hear the word of God. So we can continue to develop that good Christian character that just, Jesus just gets the kick out of it. Yes. I mean, and he loves it. Yes. You know, somewhat like what we did yesterday, going up there to uh, support our brethren and to see our brethren that we haven't seen in a long time. Now, we have, we have gone on to diff in different directions right, right. As, as the Lord has, has called us to do. Many, I, I know some there, they were still in the old way. Some in the new way, and some is all out of the way. <laughs> but they all came together as a group to celebrate the love and the kindness of a brethren that is passed on from this life. Preach. And it was a wonderful thing, and that's what folks need to do. That's what brings a smile to God's face. It's not about ridicule, but it's about coming together and lifting up and being encouraging. If we could probably just have the mindset of a maybe a funeral all the time, yes. we would be much better off. Yes. Yes. We would have that kind of heart because your heart is full of, uh, of grace and, and, 
and sympathy and empathy and love and, and encouragement and put an arm around them and, and instead of when we leave there, go back to our old way and start breaking down everybody that was there. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong. And this is what our Lord and our Savior want us to be. This is and this is how we're gonna grow truth in the life. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we have to grow within ourselves. This is why God has given us this time. Yes. So it'll be automatic for us when we meet other people. And then you won't have to put on a show for them Preach. because that's not in you. When you put on that show for them, that's a show that you have 24-7 mm -hmm. because it has become a part of you. It is now your character. Yes. Amen. So you had many women in the Bible that, that, that preached the word. I mean, there's not enough room in there to put them all. One of them was the sister named Lydia. Very wealthy woman. She was a maker of purple back in ancient days. And that was a hard color in which to make with seashells and all that chemicals and stuff that they put back back in the day to make this color purple. But all of royalty had to have purple. And they give you a, a sidebar with that. Uh, the color purple had an odor to it. It was, it was very fishy. But they interpret that smell of being wanted because it was purple. And that's what purple smelled like. <laughs> so they wanted to be bathed in it. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah for some yolk and some <laughs> that manufactured this. She had people working for her. She was a wealthy woman because it was very expensive. And they was gathered together on this, this, this beach and she was leading the charge because she had heard of Paul and then Paul and Silas and them uh, uh, walked up and heard what they was doing. So they went on and, and preached the gospel so they could understand it more perfectly. And so she invited him back into her home. And this is where the church was in her home. And guess who was doing the preaching? <laughs> Lydia. <laughs> and Tyateria, which is in the Bible, in the book of Revelations, is one of the churches that God says about the churches, the seven churches. It's Tyateria. He said, I know your love. I know your dedication. I mean, it was nothing but good accolades, but their only problem that they had was a Jezebel, like in the visual, that they allowed to float around, Jeez. causing trouble, whispering in folks' ears, and and uh, trying to go back to idolatry and, and all those other immoral things in which they did back in the day. He said, get rid of that, and you're going to be all right. Because you got everything to go except for you're tolerating that person to be in your midst. Preach. And so she was pastoring that church and she continued to pastor that church. And that wasn't that far from Corinth. So after she continued to do it, after Paul and Silas even left. And that's in Acts 18 if you want to. Want to want to get to Acts 16 and Acts 18 and verse 1 through 28. That's the whole chapter. We come to Priscilla and Aquila, and they pastored the church in their home. And these two individuals, husband and wife, and and in their home was also the the training center where they trained other pastors and preachers. One famous one they trained was Apollo, and Apollo was. He was a man of God. He was, he was trained under John's teaching. He knew the Bible. He was from Alexandria. He was very well educated. And this man could preach. He could speak. Teach. And so Paul says, hey, Priscilla, teach him Jesus. <laughs> and guess who taught him Jesus? It was Priscilla. Yeah. Taught him Jesus. And you can see, like a lot of times, her name is mentioned first. Because of her importance. Because of her importance to the work. And her church was in Corinth. One of the churches. 
And you'll read about it in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 19 if you want to go there. So that kind of lets you know just how out of touch mm -hmm. a lot of our brethren can be and, uh, by allowing their minds to be closed. Mm -hmm. And that's because they want their minds to be closed on this issue. They don't want their minds to be open to the truth. They want to be stuck in, in their tradition, stuck in the old unsubstantiated traditions that the Bible does not support at all. 2 Timothy verse 2.15, as I said before, says, study to show yourself approved. Okay. Study. Learn. Teach. Be diligent. Mm -hmm. Search the scriptures to see whether these things are true. Like the, uh, like the church of the Bereans did. They search at night and day. They say, if Paul says something, they had the scriptures. Well, let's see whether you're saying it's true. But when it comes to women... For some of my brethren, they don't want to do that. They only want to go as far as 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 and 35. That's good enough for them. Jeez. And naturally, and where they take it out of context, a wife is not to rule over her husband. That is not God's order of things. And that's not to say this, this man is some king or or prince and has to be bowed down to and, and worshiping his feet washed every day. That's not what it's saying because God really kind of points that out that a man, that a husband is supposed to love his wife even unto death. Mm -hmm. he's, he's supposed to love her the way Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Amen. And they say for the wife to respect her husband but see, a lot of times in our society, we don't have that. So this is where you get the conflict. And this is where these individuals have ammunition in which to fight. Because there's conflict in the home. They're not together. One's trying to overrule the other. you got one that wants to be overbearing on the other. Just, mm -hmm. just, just put her down. And then you got the, the other one, you got, you got the wife want to climb all over the husband. Won't, 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 want him to do everything. Just bow down to her. And if you don't, just raise hell all over the place. And that's the way it is. And that's why our society got it all messed up. And that's why you got opposition because we don't have love. We just don't. We got selfishness in the place of that that we call love. If you do everything that I say, then that means you love me. <coughs> How does that sound? Uh, that definition ain't in this book. That definition is not in that book. Because what I hear about that is because God is love and Jesus is love and all he did was to give. All he did was to see to the needs of his people. As a, an example for us. Instead of always looking for your needs to be served. Or the way you want it. The way you need to have it. And that's why people come to the church when you are giving to them and they see there is a, 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 a real compassion for them, a, 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 a real love for them, that you're really concerned about their well-being and their welfare. Not that you're putting on some show just to add numbers, but you're doing this because they need help and you're there to help them. And that's what we really got to get, get with. As a, as, as a people. And so that's why it's so important, I think, that the, the more women we see in the leadership positions, the better off. And that's not to say that every woman has to, you don't have the roles reversed. Mm -hmm. But God has called many to do his work. And we have to understand that and accept that for what it is. Amen. And don't look crazy or God eye because uh, 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 someone in a skirt is, is running things. It, it's not like that. And for all of us as true Christians, that the chains do come hard. That, that's no doubt about that. Right, that's, right. And, and that's no shame in that because chains come hard because it does. Yes, yes. It does. It's hard. It's hard. But you got to understand that you do need to change. So it's tough right now for a lot of folks.
folks that are stuck in those ways to uh, to be convinced that that women should be given uh, their place as God has called them. And I don't know what you can do to, to get them not to understand that. And some of them are uh, 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 truly uh, uh, men of God. Men of God, they, they, they think they're doing what is right. But you can see how easy it is for us to close our mind to something that, that, that might be distasteful for us. Mm -hmm. Or, this is the thing, we always hate to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Preach. And so we are, we're going to fight to keep our righteousness. Mm -hmm. Even though it can be laid out in front of you that it is wrong. But you say to yourself, I can't be wrong. Preach. You wrong. I ain't doing that. But this is where our minds and our hearts have to be open. Your minds and your hearts have to be open to this. Even to accept even the brethren that don't accept this understanding. And that's where your mind and your heart is open. But here's a, here's a thing that people have never thought about. About the word. Now we know the word was Jesus. The word was Jesus. And speaking about women with the word. Mary carried the word okay. in her body for nine months. And after nine months was over, she delivered the word. Amen. How about that? Amen. Even before you got the word from him, she had the word in her. Amen. And then when the time was right, she let the word come forth. Okay. So we can think of it like that. We can go even go back in the Old Testament to Deborah was a judge in the nation of Israel. And you didn't get no higher than a judge in Israel. She was a, a queen or emperor. She judged. She judged. God gave her the wisdom and the understanding. She was there in his place. Because God didn't come down and sit in front of everybody. So she, he used Deborah to do so. And she was one of the great righteous judges of Israel. And she was a woman. So all that other stuff they're talking about is nonsense. And it really gets in the way. And it hampers the work. So we can just understand just how important that rib that we have is. That rib does good work. Good work. And God calls it to do good work. So, just to close this out, I'm going to just say this. To the women, to all the women that is being called to serve God, in the capacity of delivering the word or pastoring a church or shepherding God's people. God bless you and God speed. Amen. Amen. Amen.